<clears throat> it would be hard to overstate the relevance and the importance of these readings. To come against a mindset of our times that has infected the church and society. What do I mean? These readings today, these commands of our Lord to point out to others their sins would make absolutely no sense if we could not know clearly what is sin and what is virtue. If we did not have clear boundaries about what it means to belong to the church. Because the gospel is giving a method here whereby you consider someone as no longer belonging to the church. Well, you can't do that arbitrarily. You can't do that because you don't like somebody. There have to be objective standards. I mean, these readings, all three of them, presuppose that there are some clear objective boundaries that we can all know and agree upon, in fact, that we have to agree upon if we're going to be a community of the church, boundaries between right and wrong, good and evil, sin and virtue. Otherwise, how can we be the community of the church? How do we know who we are? So let's come against some of the problems that we have in our times that, that confuse all this and turn these readings on their head. First of all, Let's look at the second reading from St. Paul. He says all the commandments, and he names several of them, are summed up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he says they are summed up. He doesn't say they are replaced. We have very many people today some of them, again, active in the church, and they pass themselves off as teachers of the faith, who speak as though the command of love of neighbor replaces the other commandments. It's not, that's not what the Word of God says at all. It says exactly the opposite. They are summed up in this. So when you say, in other words, love your neighbor... What this reading is telling us is that love has a content. Love isn't just a label we slap on whatever it is that we want to do. Love isn't just a good intention that we have as we go ahead and do whatever it is we want to do with a good intention. The end doesn't justify the means. Love is not a motive that we add to our actions if the actions in and of themselves are evil. Certain actions are always wrong. Killing a baby, for example, by abortion. Always wrong. No justification for it. It's always against love. So you can't come along, therefore, and say, well, I'm going to do it anyway because my motive is love. Adultery. Fornication. Having sexual relations with someone of the same gender. Always wrong. You can't justify it by saying, oh, well, they love one another. That's not what this passage is saying. Some people think it says this. Oh, well, you know, it's all, you know, about love your neighbor, so therefore, you know, you don't have to worry about those actual specific details about what adultery is and, you know, uh, what, what killing a baby is. This is not what it's saying at all. You do have to worry about the details because what it's saying is those very details are essential to love. You're not loving a person if you lead them to treat the human body or human sexuality in a way contrary to God's plan because God made us according to His plan, according to His Word, and we will be happy and fulfilled only when we follow it in full obedience, in joyful adherence, letting God transform us into the likeness of Himself. It's not, this is not about watering down the particulars and the details and the obligations of the specific commandments. Just the opposite. It is telling us love is not some kind of vague word. 
it has a specific content, there are certain things we may never do. And this is understandable. And there are other things we must do. Don't let people with theological degrees or clerical attire fool you on this. Because the knowledge of this doesn't come from theological degrees or clerical attire. It comes from the faith that we all have. Remember, theology starts with a yes. And if a person can't say that simple yes, don't listen to anything else that they do say. A simple yes, Lord, I believe. Adultery is wrong. Abortion is wrong. Stealing and coveting and, and, and idolatry and false worship, they're wrong. I know what they are. I firmly reject them. That's what I did at my baptism when I said I reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises, and I refuse to be mastered by sin, and I believe in God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church. I believe these things. We say yes first to a faith that is intelligible and that is clear. Once we say that yes, then we can delve into theological studies that bring us more deeply into the understanding of all these details. But going deeper into the understanding of all these details cannot dilute the yes or confuse the clarity of the yes. The deeper we go into theology, it's not going to become any less clear that adultery is wrong. It's not going to become any less clear clear that abortion is wrong. So there's a Sister Simone wandering around the country out there, allying herself with the party of death, the Democrats, and she says when it comes to abortion that, oh, it's above her pay grade to know what to say about that. Give me a break. This is the simple truth of the faith. You say yes. Either you believe or you don't believe. Now, if you don't, well, first of all, the first reading tells us we've got to point out the sin. Oh, there's plenty of people going around today saying, oh, well, we should never tell anybody anything is a sin. What? Son of man, I have appointed you watchmen for the house of Israel. Warn them. For me, the Lord says. Notice what's happening here. I remember when I was doing parish work before I was privileged to start working full-time in the pro-life movement with Priests for Life, which I started leading in 1993. It's been a while. But when I was doing parish work between 1988 and 1993, I remember uh, putting in the parish bulletin every so often these lists of, uh, of sins. Examination of conscience, it was. A detailed examination of conscience. I'd go through each of the commandments one at a time. And, you know, people didn't like it when it was so specific, or some people didn't like it. Others really loved it, but some people say, oh, this is too specific. You know, what, what this is, and, and you know how they, they, they justified themselves by saying, well, this is Father Frank's interpretation of the Ten Commandments. And I got up one Sunday after I had heard that, and I said, well, I appreciate the compliment, but I can't accept it. Some of you are trying to make me out to be the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity. I did not write the commandments. I was articulating for them the specifics. See, this is where some people go wrong. Oh, oh, love your neighbor, love God. Oh, yeah, that sounds very nice because you can interpret it whatever way you want. But when the commandments get very specific about what you can and cannot do, people become very uncomfortable because now you have a measuring rod that not only you can see and understand, but somebody else can see and understand. And unless you're going to put all this down into the, some kind of secret core of your own being and pretend that there's something about conscience that is anything different from your mind, knowing the difference between right and wrong, that's what conscience is. We have to demystify it a little bit. It's not some kind of separate voice inside. It's not some kind of special oracle or special, you know, vessel of communication with God. It's your mind. Learning the commandments, like Jesus said them here, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. We learn these things with our mind, the same mind that you, by which you learn to you know, fix a car or cook a meal. It's the same mind learning now the, the higher things of God. And that mind, knowing the difference between right and wrong, tells you before you do something that you should or shouldn't do it. It's the next to the last judgment that you make before you make the judgment to actually do it or not do it. 
conscience is your mind telling you if it's right or wrong. So that's that's what it is. Don't 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 mystify it or complicate it. And some people, boy, oh boy, they love the mystical, cloudy, vague, because it's vague. So they can get away with anything. Oh, well, I'm doing it in a loving way. Give me a break. What we're saying here, what, what God is saying here to Ezekiel is, listen, you're going to speak for me. So those people in the parish, some of them, they said, oh, well, this is Father Frank's interpretation of the commandments. Who do you think I am? Who do you think I'm claiming to be? I'm the same as, the, as, as everybody else. We've received a faith that we all know. As I always say, you know, you don't have any fewer or, or you don't have any fewer books of the Bible than I have. You don't have any fewer chapters of the catechism than I have, than your bishop has, or that the Pope has. Or that any saint of the church at any time has ever had. It's the same Bible that we all have. It's the same catechism that we all know. It's the same commandments that we can all read, understand, and look around and see the difference between right and wrong. Now, we're not talking here... God and Ezekiel, Paul, Jesus, me, we're not talking about judging the inside of somebody's soul. Because just as clearly as Ezekiel and, and Paul and, and, and Jesus say what they're saying today, they also tell us, you know, you don't judge. And that what that means is you don't judge where exactly a person is standing with God in their interior soul. You don't judge what exactly their conscience is telling them. You don't judge how exactly or why they are doing or not doing a certain thing or what they are thinking. You can't be a mind reader. Uh, you can't judge the motives of their hearts. I mean, very often we can't even judge our own motives, right? It, it can be pretty confusing why we do or don't do certain things. So this is not about judging the inside. It is about judging the outside. It's about judging the difference between you shall not commit adultery and you shall commit adultery. It's about judging the difference between you shall not commit abortion or permit abortion and you shall commit abortion. Those things we can judge, those things we must judge. If we can't judge them, what in the, how, how does this reading make any sense? I have appointed you, God says to Ezekiel, a watchman for the house of Israel. You shall warn them for me. You're not imposing your opinion. You're not going around promoting your own idea. You didn't write the commandments. You're speaking to them, God says, for me. How is it that you're speaking to them for me? Because I've told you my will. I've given you my word. I've revealed to you the truth of my commandments. How can we have people going around and saying, well, we really don't know what the commandments require? We don't know what the commandments require? And yet we're supposed to encourage others to follow them and warn people if they don't follow them? You know what one of the, one of the key ways, I want to apply this to the elections. You know, I, had a, I, I did something here the other night that you probably have never seen or heard of done before. I had a prayer service of reparation for the sins of the Democrat Party of the United States. I'm not judging any particular individual because I and you and nobody can see inside their soul, but we don't have to. In order to say, in order to be a watchman, in order to say what's right and what's wrong, we don't have to see inside their soul. We just have to see what's outside. What do they say? What do they do? And if somebody says, I support legal abortion, that is a serious violation of the commandment thou shalt not kill. Serious violation of love of neighbor. Serious violation of the law. Serious evil. The readings today, if they mean anything at all, they mean we've got to speak up about it. We've got to speak up about it. It's a spiritual duty. Now, some people will say, well, Father Frank does a, 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 a prayer service of reparation for the sins of the Democrat Party. Ooh, he's being political. Ooh, he's mixing religion and politics. Oh, yeah? Really? If you tell the wicked, wicked one, you surely shall die. If you... If God tells the wicked that. And if you do not speak out to dissuade the wicked from his way. Listen to that again. 
If you do not speak out to dissuade the wicked one from his way, the wicked shall die for his guilt, but I will hold you responsible for his death. We have politicians going around saying it's okay to kill babies. In the Democrat Party, we even have politicians. And by the way, you know, every member of the House of Representatives, either they'll finish their term, or, well, they'll all finish their term, either they'll leave Congress or they'll be running now for re-election. You've got to ask every one of them a question. First of all, do you know who your candidates are for the U.S. House of Representatives? Who represents your congressional district right now? I hope you know their name. Who represents your congressional district right now? We have Congressman Bill Posey here in the, uh, the 8th Congressional District in Florida, good pro-life congressman. And uh, do you know the name of your congressman or woman? And do you know who is running against them in this 2020 election? My friends, if you don't know that, those of you who live in the United States, I'm talking about, of course, please find out. Please find out by tomorrow. <laughs> I'll look it up tonight after this mass. We've got to know. Because we have to warn the politicians I mean, I'm just, this is what the reading is saying. We have to warn the person who is doing evil, and they're, 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 this is a pretty public thing. They're saying publicly it's okay for there to be abortions. They even want us to pay for it. But what I'm talking about now in the House of Representatives, there's been a, an effort underway for the last couple of years by the Republicans to protect babies who are born alive after a failed abortion. Sometimes an abortion fails to kill a baby. And no, the protections are not adequate. They'll say, oh, well, infanticide is already illegal. Well, yeah, but in not every case. There's loopholes, there's gaps. The protection isn't adequate. It needs to be strengthened. The Republicans are trying to do that. Democrats don't want to have anything to do with it. They're actually behaving and speaking in such a way that ends up Allowing an abortionist to smother and kill a baby after the baby has come out of the mother and is alive. These are documented cases. I'm not making it up. Go to bornalive.us and read it for yourself. What I'm saying is, these people, we're not, you know, judging them or, or, or imposing ourselves, inserting ourselves into their business. They're coming to us saying, I want to represent you. I want to lead you. I want to write your laws. I want, to, I want to have your votes. So they're opening the door pretty wide for us to come in and ask certain questions and warn them that not only is this a wickedness that they have to pay for themselves spiritually, and our bishops have done a great job in doing this. The bishops have done this. In their document, Living the Gospel of Life, you can find it as well as my commentary at gospeloflife.net. They warn the politicians of the spiritual danger to their own souls. The bishops warn them. Don't think this is something I'm making up. The bishops warn them in their document, Living the Gospel of Life, that you can find at gospeloflife.net, that there is spiritual danger in embracing abortion. They also came out in uh, the Vatican issued a special document back, uh, oh, about 17, 18 years ago, saying that those Catholics in public office are also not to advance the redefinition of marriage. And, I mean, they're laying out, the, again, you know, Jesus did not say that love your neighbor as yourself replaces the other commandments. He said it sums them up. So when you have these specific commandments, you're seeing the shape, the contours, the boundaries of what love means. It has a meaning. It has a content. So if people are coming forward and saying that they believe in things like abortion, well, not only are we warning them for their own spiritual good, we're warning them for the common good. When the church teaches about elections, the church talks about the common good. What way do we have to go as a nation? What way do we have to go with public policy? 
We've got to be following the commandments of God. And the readings today make it clear. Speak up and warn the person who's on the wrong track that they are on the wrong track and urge them to come on to the right track. And again, you're not urging them to, to, to follow your opinion. You're not trying to impose your opinion on them. You're not trying to impose anything on anybody. You're simply fulfilling the Lord's command here of speaking out Echoing what he has already said about what's right and what's wrong. Why is this so hard for some people to understand? And in the gospel, it tells us the church has some specific boundaries. The church has some specific boundaries. And some people come along and say, oh, well, we can't tell people that they're you know, not Catholic enough. What in the world does that mean? We can't tell people that they're not Catholic enough or that they're not Christian enough. Enough is, in a, is, is not an appropriate word there. You either are or you aren't. And what that means is, again, not a judgment on your soul, but you either are saying that clear yes to these commandments or you're saying no. It's not a matter of saying someone's Catholic enough or Christian enough. It's just saying, hey, for the good of the community, especially if you're a public person, just tell us, do you or do you not embrace this way of life? Well, friends, be a watchman. Do it kindly. Do it prudently. Do it with a good balance and common sense. Do it joyfully. Well, let's bear witness to the truth. Let's realize there is a truth. Let's not be afraid to speak it because it's a great act of love for your neighbor. When you point out to them when something's wrong and graciously urge them to embrace what is right. Jesus, keep us on the right path. May we always rejoice in your commandments and share the blessing of eternal life. Amen.